Hey everybody, Doomwake here, and welcome back to another discussion video here on the channel. We have Duskmorn House of Horror fast approaching. It's only a couple of days away. I'm actually going to be participating in the Magic Online early access event. I think is I think it's early access is what they call it. And I got a whole bunch of decks lined up. So be on the lookout for some Duskmorn content in Pioneer over the coming weeks. But today, we are going to be discussing my personal favorites. I got a few honorable mentions, and then we'll crack right into the top 10. Before we continue, first and foremost, just a little bit of housekeeping. Be sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video. If you are enjoying the content, subscribing to the channel really does help out the analytics. And most importantly, let me know in the comment section, what is your favorite card? And last but certainly not least, if you guys want to purchase any of the cards you see in today's video or any cards in general, head over to CoolStuffInc.com, use promo code DOOM for 5% off your order. They got cool stuff, and they got it in stock. With all that out of the way, let us get started with some honorable mentions. And the first one I want to show on your screen here is a little card called Shard Mage's Rescue. So, one mana, Flash Aura, Chant Creature you control. Uh, as long as it entered this turn, a Chant Creature has Hexproof, and it gets plus one, plus one. So, there are a lot of analogs to this, there's what, I'm trying to think, there is Lauren's Escape, there is Crumb and Get It, there's God's Willing, plenty of protection spells. The nice thing about Shard Mage's Rescue specifically, it is an aura, so that's good for a couple of reasons. One, you get the permanent bonus, unlike if it was just instant plus one plus one hexproof until end of turn. So you keep the permanent bonus, and if you are interested in the aura subtype, maybe if you're a Boggles Enjoyer, that aura staying on the creature will benefit things like ethereal armor, all that glitters, etc., etc. So, pretty innocuous card, but I think this is going to be pretty good in a couple of different decks. Like I said, Heroic, Boggles, they're the two that come to mind the most. And if you're into this sort of effect, this is one of the better options available for you. Honorable mention number two, one of my personal favorite cards in the set. Didn't quite crack the top ten. I think mostly it's just a card that I'm going to have to play with, and I, I just want to get my hands on this little guy. Clockwork Percussionist. So this is single red mana. You'll notice theme here. A lot of the cards cost one mana. 1-1 one, one haste, and when it dies, you exile the top card of your library. You may play it until the end of your next turn. So there's a couple of reasons why this card's pretty good. First and foremost, it is an artifact itself. Gleeful Demolition a card that is very popular in both Standard and Pioneer Convoke decks, really needs extra artifacts. And this just so happens to be an artifact that wants to hit the graveyard. When you Gleeful Demolition this, you get the three tokens off the Gleeful, but then you get to exile a card, maybe you even get lucky enough and hit a Convoke creature, and you get to play that until the end of your next turn. So even if you use all of your mana, the turn that you're destroying or sacrificing the Clockwork Percussionist, you still have access to that card for next turn. And in stuff like Racto Sacrifice, they play Witch's Oven, Deadly Dispute, plenty of ways to sacrifice creatures. I could see this little guy being a nice little role player. It is also two types. It's an artifact and a creature. So there's some delirium synergies and, and delirium things that you might want to utilize this with, and that could certainly be something that you want to pair this with. All right, next up on the list, we have Aboran Oculus, this little eye, I guess, as it were. So two and a blue for a 5-5 five, five flyer. Pretty good stats. Surely there's a downside. As an additional cost to cast this spell, you have to exile six cards from your graveyard. That's a lot. And then at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, you manifest Dread which is look at the top two, put one of them into play face down as a 2-2, the other into your graveyard. So this is a card that is pretty difficult to cast. I've, I've heard people compare it to like the Pioneer Merktad region, and in modern, it is much easier to fill your graveyard up pretty quickly. So I don't really intend on casting this with the Exile 6. What I want to be doing with this card is returning it with Helping Hand or Recommission. There's already been, you know, Dexton's past standard format that were Monastery Mentor, Haughty Jin, and then Recommission Helping Hand to get them back. And in Pioneer, you have similar setups, right? You have ways to discard like Faithful Mending, Chart of Course, Otherworldly Gaze, Picklock Prankster, and then you can mill over this or Monastery Mentor. And it's sort of like a weird Monastery Mentor where you're getting more creatures every turn. And it's a 5-5 flyer. So basically, if you can cheat the casting of this, 
I think it could be pretty good uh, in a mentor deck like that. So keep an eye out for this one. All right, next up, we have another personal favorite of mine and one that I have not really seen a lot of people talking about and one that I don't exactly know where it goes into. But when the first time I read this card, it, it read pretty powerful to me. And that is Silent Hall Creeper. So this is two mana for a 1-1, one, one, one in a blue. It cannot be blocked. And whenever it deals combat damage to a player, choose one that hasn't been chosen. You can put two plus one plus one counters on it, draw a card, or have it become a copy of another target creature you control. Now, presumably, the idea behind this is you want to get the first two abilities first, and then on the last time that it hits them, after you've exhausted the other abilities, then you can copy it, because if you copy it, it would no longer have that line of text on it. But two mana for a 1-1 unblockable that can clone a creature you control, I mean, it seems reasonably costed enough, and if you don't have a good creature in play, you have two other options up until the point where you have something else that's good to clone in play. So you can draw a card, maybe that gets you into something else that you want to clone, maybe you put two counters on it, and then when you finally clone something, it gets a little bit bigger. Now, again, not exactly sure where this goes, but two mana clone type effects tend to be reasonably costed for constructed, so I would not be surprised if this found a home at some point, just not entirely sure where it would go. Let me know in the comments for this one. All right, next honorable mention up here is the Chainsaw. This is an equipment. This is one in a red. When it enters, it deals three to up to one target creature. Whenever one or more creatures dies, put a red counter on it. Love the flavor on this card, by the way. And the equipped creature gets plus X plus zero, where X is the number of rev counters on it, and its equip cost is three. So at a bare minimum, ETB, kill a creature, put a counter on it, and then you get something that gives your creature plus one plus zero. It is pretty expensive. But where this card really shines is when you're looping the triggers, like Cauldron Familiar Witch's Oven, again, a lot of the stuff in the Sacrifice deck, Deadly Dispute, the Percussionist we just talked about, uh, unlucky witness with other sacrifice effects, blood tithe harvester. There's plenty of ways to put creatures into the graveyard, specifically with harvester. Harvester puts two counters on this because you sacrifice the harvester, gets a counter on it, and then when the harvester ability resolves, it kills their creature, which puts another counter on the chainsaw. Now that deck, I don't think has any evasive creatures, but you can probably find some to put the chainsaw on because ideally you want some sort of evasion with it. But I don't know. I mean, kill a creature and then it has some sort of synergy type effects that go along with it. Maybe something here. Next up, we have Tyvar the Pummeler. It's a green, green one for a 3-3. Three, three. You can tap another untapped creature you control to give Tyvar indestructible until end of turn and tap it. And you can pay 3 GG to give creatures you control plus X plus X, where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. So bare minimum, it's going to be at least three, ideally more. This is an elf, and I think that there have been various pioneer elf decks in the past. Shout out to my boy Xbox Greg, has been a, a really big proponent of that deck. And I like this in that deck because it gives you a little bit of built-in protection, similar to like Azuri. Well, Azuri regenerated target elf, so this only protects itself but it has a little bit of built-in protection and is a decent mana sink. So I don't, there's maybe something there, just like the elf typing, the fact that the elf deck generates a bunch of mana anyways, with stuff like, I think they're playing the three tree city now with Nykthos and, and things like that. So it's a good way to use that mana outside of elves. Not sure, maybe like a mono green devotion, because again, that deck generates a lot of mana, but I don't know, just like three, three that protects itself. Seems like it, it is a potentially good in decks like that. We got a creepy doll next. Very, very creepy one. Arabella Abandoned Doll. This is red-white for a 1-3 legendary artifact creature. And whenever it attacks, it deals X damage to each opponent and you gain X life where X is the number of creatures you control with power, two or less. So going back to the Clockwork Percussionist that we discussed earlier, Boros Convoke. Deck that puts a lot of creatures into play and... Essentially, all of them happen to have two or less power. Gleeful Demolition, Thalia, all of the one drops, like, I guess Warden grows past two power, but all the Inspectors, the Epicures, essentially every creature in the deck has two or less power. Now, the big issue for me with Arabella is it does not have haste, and it has to attack in order to trigger. So you have to untap with your two mana 1-3, which I don't know how often you're doing, 
Now, there is a setup where if you get to five mana, you can go Arabella into Imodane's Recruiter to give the Arabella haste, but, you know, I'm not entirely sure. The trigger is very powerful. The life gain's huge, too. So if your opponent doesn't kill it, it this is going to deal them a lot of damage because it also curves nicely into things like you play Arabella on turn three and then turn four, maybe you go Gleeful Demolition into Recruiter and that just sets up a whole boatload of damage. So maybe something here, I'll probably try it out as maybe a one or two of, but yeah, reasonably powerful card and I, I wouldn't be surprised if it saw playing Convoke. All right, last honorable mention here. This one's just going to be pretty, pretty brief here. Ghost Vacuum. So really the only reason we want to play this card is because it's a one mana artifact and only the first line is detects is relevant. Tap exile target card from a graveyard. I've been playing a lot with the black green crime decks with free strider lookout, iridescent vine lasher, you know, sometimes other crime paths like Vadmir and Karavek and things like that. And ghost vacuum is a way to trigger crimes. Previously we've played scrabbling claws, which is a much worse version of Ghost Vacuum, so this seems like a pretty strict upgrade to Scrabbling Claws because it is targeted Graveyard Heat. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Just nothing too fancy, but I think a pretty good enabler into your into the crime sort of stuff. And now it is time to enter into the top 10. Coming in at number 10, we have Turn Inside Out. Those Rakdos prowess decks that we've been talking about on the metagame videos, seems like they maybe got a new toy. One red mana instant target creature gets plus three plus oh until end of turn, and when it dies, manifest dread. They do have a couple of different cards that give plus three power, the Monstrous Rage and Titan Strength. Now, it's I'm not going to suggest this card is better than Monstrous Rage, because Monstrous Rage is arguably one of the best cards in the deck. But I think this might be a little bit better than Titan Strength, because the the big thing here is when it dies this turn manifest dread if you get into a combat step where you can say for example you pump your hardfire hero you end up trading with that in combat deal your opponent a little bit of damage and then you can manifest dread to look for maybe another hardfire hero or perhaps a slick shot show off and then you can flip that up next turn and then maybe one shot your opponent from there so just something to think about. I think this might be an upgrade to Titan Strength in that Rakdos Prowess deck, but time will tell. Number nine, we have Hedge Shredder. So 2GG, 5-5 five, five Artifact Vehicle. The crew cost is only one, which is pretty good for a 5-5. Five, five. Whenever it attacks, you may mill two cards. And whenever one or more land cards are put into your graveyard from your library, put them onto the battlefield tapped. I think... And I might be crazy on this one. I think this might be a good card for Greasefang. It doesn't necessarily beat the Graveyard Hate. And I think that a lot of supplemental threats in Greasefang have to be looked through the lens of, does this win if my opponent Leyline of the Voids me in game two? Because it's going to happen a decent amount of the time. And this doesn't beat that. But it is still a 5-5 five, five that's easy to crew. Every single creature in your deck crews it. So it hits for a good amount of damage. And what's nice is in the games where they don't have Rest in Peace... Whenever it attacks, you mill two, so you get to look for Parhelions or, or stuff like that. And whenever one or more land, that second line of text, very important with stuff like Grizzly Salvage and Cash Grab and all the self mills, because if you say Grizzly Salvage into three lands and a creature, you take the creature, you get all three of those lands off of the Head Shredder. And believe it or not, the lands actually kind of matter with Grease Fang, because I think with this, it actually makes hardcasting Parhelion a realistic goal more often than not if you have this. So just something to keep in mind, maybe worth experimenting. Time will tell, but I do like the stats on this card and it seems like it's reasonably aggressively costed. And coming in at number eight, we have more Grease Fang fodder, Overlord of the Bailmerk. First, I gotta say, I love the Overlords in the set, by the way. There's a lot of cool stuff we can do with Enigmatic Incarnation because they're creatures and enchantments, but they get discounts and they still trigger up the Beanstalk. So the impending mechanic is sort of like Suspend, where you can pay... Uh, an amount of mana, so in this case, one in a black, it enters with five counters, but it's not a creature when it enters. And at the beginning of your end step, remove a counter from it, and then once the last counter is removed, it becomes the creature. So two mana for an enchantment, essentially, five counters, and then when it enters or attacks, so when the enchantment comes into play when you cast it the first time, you mill four, then you can return a non-avatar creature or planeswalker from your graveyard to your hand. So what I like about this in Grease Fang is on turn two, it's sort of like another Grizzly Salvage or Cash Grab, pretty similar type of effect to that. 
where you mill over cards, look for Grease Fang, and this does find Grease Fang. But later in the game, it's just a five mana five five. And Grizzly Salvage and Cash Grab don't necessarily have that sort of modality. So I think that maybe there's something here for Grease Fang. Potentially there's some sort of reanimator setup that you want to do this and maybe a tracks and things like that. Not sure what that would look like, but I don't know. It's got enough text on it and it's flexible, which is why I love these overlords so much because of their flexibility. Coming in at number seven, we have Kona Rescue Beastie Boys. Three and a green for a four three and it has survival. At the beginning of your second main phase, if it's tapped, you may put a permanent card from your hand onto the battlefield. So there's a number of different ways to tap this. Vehicles, number one, Smuggler's Copter, Essica's Chariot, Sky Sovereign, with the aforementioned Head Shredder. There's plenty of vehicles that you can tap this with. But more importantly, I think the one that people are overlooking is cards like Springleaf Drum and Moon Snare Prototype. So they're similar cards, but you can tap it and a creature you control to make a mana. Not only do those cards ramp you, but they also give the Kona effective haste, where the turn you play the Kona, you can tap the Kona to the Springleaf Drum and then trigger it in the second main phase. Now, what are we putting into play off of this? Well, I like to dream big. I'm trying to put on missions into play, maybe a Traxa, maybe one with the multiverse, and then casting stuff like draw spells, Ulamogs, things like that. I want to go really, really big with Kona. Maybe you don't have to go that big. Maybe you can play this in a more value-oriented deck and just put a Chariot into play. Maybe that's good enough. I think there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with Kona, but I would highly recommend pairing it with specifically Springleaf Drum and Moon Snare Prototype to sort of give it effective haste and just let your imaginations go wild. And in that same vein of survival creatures, number six on the list, Rip Spawn Hunter. Big fan of this card. So four mana, four, four, and then beginning of your second main phase, if it's tapped, you reveal the top X, where X is its power. You put any number of creature and or vehicle cards with different powers from among them into your hand, rest on the bottom. Now, people have experimented with Celestia vehicles in the past. I know that if you've been playing Pioneer for a little bit, you may be familiar with Gruul vehicles, but people have tried Celestia. The white splash is mostly for stuff like Voice of Resurgence, Skyclave Apparition. There's probably some other white cards like Get Lost, maybe other removal, but Rip is a really good payoff because the thing about the vehicles decks is they're spread out on creature types. You have Copter as a three, Voice is a two, your elves are all one power, so you have one, two, three, Rip is a four, Lovestruck Beast is a five, Sky Sovereign's a six. So you have plenty of different types of powers spread out across. And I mean, if you can build your deck with almost entirely creatures and vehicles and just a couple of removal spells, I could see you drawing two to three cards on average with Rip, which is kind of insane. And again, you have plenty of ways to tap it for free. Smuggler's Copter, Essica's Chariot. And what's nice about Copter is Copter comes into play, comes down before Rip. So if you curve the Copter into Rip, you can tap it immediately, crew the Copter, and then second main, pick up a couple of cards with Rip. So keep an eye out for this one. I really think there's going to be some cool stuff down the pipeline with Rip Spawn Hunter. Coming in at number five, we have Sheltered by Ghosts. Now, funny story here. I was recording an episode of The Dive Down last night, and this came up in, in conversation. We were doing some spoilers, and I told them I did not think this was a real card when I first read it. And I had to read it about three or four times before I sort of realized what was happening here. So this is an aura. It's a two mana card. It's an enchant creature you control. When it enters, exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until it leaves the battlefield. So just O-ring, un unconditional O-ring. And the enchanted creature has plus one plus O and has lifelink and ward two. So for two mana, you get a removal spell, you get... Ward 2 on your creature in a power bonus and lifelink for 2 mana. <laughs> now, obviously, the downside is that if they kill your creature, they kill the sheltered by ghost, they get the thing back, and the house of cards crumbles. But what if you put this on a creature that has hexproof that they can't target? And that is why I think that both sheltered by ghost and shard mage's rescue form this good backbone for a boggle shell. Uh, because you can also search Sheltered by Ghosts off of Light Paws, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, I will be playing quite a bit of Boggles, and I mean, Boggles historically always, always had a good Phoenix matchup anyways, and I can't imagine these new cards make it any worse. So yeah, Sheltered by Ghosts, really, really sick card. 
And then coming in at number four, we have unidentified hover ships. Speaking of green white vehicles that we discussed earlier during, earlier in the list, this is white white one for a two two flying vehicle. The crew cost is only one, so pretty small crew cost. When it enters, exile up to one target creature with toughness five or less. And then when the hover ship leaves the battlefield, the exiled card's owner manifests dread. Doesn't get the creature back, which is pretty important. Sort of like a Skyclave Apparition type of deal, where you Skyclave their thing, and then if they kill the Skyclave, they get an illusion token that has the power toughness equal to the mana value. So in instead of that, they manifest dread, which you could say is better or worse in certain circumstances, where if they hit a good creature off the manifest, then it's worse, but if they hit two lands or something, they just get a vanilla 2-2, and who cares? But yeah, 2-2 flying, crew cost of one, three mana. I think this is going to replace Skyclave Apparition in most of the decks that you would want to play it in, because the fact that this has flying is huge for those decks. Again, we talked about Rip Spawn Hunter, the green-white vehicle shell. This is certainly going to be a slam dunk in that deck. But yeah, most aggressive white decks, if you're playing Skyclave, I think this is a pretty big upgrade. Although Skyclave can hit Fable the Mirror Breaker and other non-creature permanents, so maybe there's a bit of a debate there. But I like this card quite a bit. Number three, we have Overlord of the Hauntwood. So we discussed Overlords earlier with Overlord of the Bale Merc. And I like this one I, the most of the cycle because it is green and Enigmatic Incarnation is green and Up the Beanstalk is green. So this one is five mana for a six, five. The impending is four counters for one GG. And whenever it enters or attacks, you make a tapped colorless land token named everywhere. That is every basic land type. So there's a couple of important things here. I, I, I may not have mentioned this before, but when you impending this, which means when you're, you're casting it for its impending cost, you still trigger up the beanstalk because it looks at the top right hand corner, which is five, three GG. So you're triggering Beanstalk with this. It's an enchantment, so you can sacrifice it to Enigmatic Incarnation. That's really important because they haven't really played six drops ever, right? At least, like when I was looking at Enigmatic List, I don't know if I've ever seen them play a six drop because they don't have many fives to sack to it. So this being a five that you can cast for cheaper, you can curve this on turn three and then Enigmatic on four, sack it and go get a six drop. That opens up a lot of possibilities. I think the best six drop you can get is probably Sanctuary Warden, which is really good, but I'm sure there's probably some other ones too. Rurikthar against Lotus Field. So it really opens all those options up. This is also a ramp spell. You pay it for three mana, you get the everywhere token. And it's not only a ramp spell, it gives you all five land types, which then lets you cast Leyline Binding. So for example, you could even go overlord on three and then turn four you have five total mana because you got the everywhere land off of this and you have guaranteed five types from the everywhere land which five mana lets you go binding and enigmatic so it, it sets up a lot of cool chains with enigmatic and i'm going to be playing a lot of that card with a lot of these overlords in the, in the next couple of weeks and we are coming into our top two if you have made it all the way to this part of the video i want you to do me a big favor pause the video Go down into the comment section and let me know what you think I put as the top two cards. No cheating. I'm watching. With all of that, let's get into the top two. Number two, we have, drumroll please, Valgavoth Terror Eater. You're not going to be casting this basically ever. You are going to be cheating this into play either with Indomitable Creativity, Transmogrify, or maybe some sort of reanimate angle. But this seems powerful. Now, I don't know if this is better than a Traxel or Vaultborn Tyrant yet, but what I like about Valgavoth is it's impossible to kill for basically any deck that isn't playing Sweepers. Good Phoenix, good luck killing this thing. They have to sacrifice, what, like, nine non-land permanents or whatever? Yeah, that's not happening. The Ley Line of the Void aspect, I think, is the most important part about this card, where once it's in play, they can no longer put phoenixes in the graveyard or set up a cruise or anything like that. Other decks can't get Kroxa or any sort of graveyard value. It's a 9-9 flying lifelink, which makes it impossible to race, and you even get some spells off of it. So I think that there are certain metagames and matchups you would rather play this as your creativity target of choice than Atraxa or Vaultborn Tyrant. 
but time will tell, and we'll have to see if the metagame shapes up to that point, and if Valgavoth will indeed be eating a lot of terror over the next couple of weeks. And with all of that said, if you've made it all the way to this part, you probably have an idea of what number one is, and that is Fear of Missing Out. I think a lot of people agree that this is probably just the single best card in the set. Now, it's weird, because Pioneer, I think it's a little bit harder to achieve Delirium, but oh boy, is the payoff worth it. So this is a 2-3 for 2 mana. When it enters, you discard draw, so you get a little bit of value that way, and it helps itself get towards Delirium. It itself is an enchantment creature. So for example, if you have an extra copy and you discard that to the first one, you now have two types in your graveyard. With Fable Passage, that's three. It's maybe easier to get to four than I thought. And whenever it attacks for the first time each turn, if you have Delirium, you untap target creature and you get an additional combat phase. Additional combat phases on your two mana, two, three creature that also loots. What are we doing? What are we talking about here? Again, crazy, crazy card. There's so many applications and so many ridiculous starts that I could see involving this card with like Reckless Stormseeker. If you can like get an additional combat phase with that, you get another trigger with the Stormseeker. Essica's Chariot, you can untap that. So tons and tons of ways. And now that I'm thinking about it, Fable the Mirror Breaker helps enable Delirium. The Vehicles deck has a lot of spread out types like enchantments and artifacts and creatures. This card is ridiculous. I'm going to be playing a lot with it. And I do believe it is the best card in the set. It's a little bit better in modern because you can get Delirium much easier in that format. But I mean, if you have ever wanted to find a Delirium payoff, this is certainly that. Thank you all again for watching. I hope you had a great time. Let me know what your favorite card is from Duskmorn in the comment section down below. As always, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and until next time, adios.